Hey, Big Nose. Yeah, I'm talking to you, Big Nose. The one with the big nose. Don't, don't pretend you don't even notice me. Big Nose, hey, Big Nose. Ah, fuck you, you stuck up bitch. The following program contains scenes of death. The rape and murder of the Newcastle schoolgirl has engrossed and enraged the community of Stockton. She was so young. She was only 14 years old. Violent sexual assault and murder. So it was up there on the of worst of the After a three month investigation, 18 year old man. There was an egghead philosopher who once said, There is no greater crime than to take a life. But to take the life of a child is a deed so evil, for the thought to even leave your lips will most certainly bring damnation from even the most forgiving of the gods. Case in point, meet one 14-year-old schoolgirl named Lily, your typical teenager who stood out because her forename was identical to her surname. Lee had recently been invited to a classmate's birthday party at the Stockton Beach Club, an abandoned derelict building occasionally hired out for functions. Witnesses testify that Lee Lee and her best friend had arrived at the party at approximately 6 p.m. The event was unchaperoned with 60 to 100 guests in attendance. The services of two bouncers had been procured for the evening. Handsome. The girls, aided by a bottle of Jim Bean whiskey mixed with Coca-Cola, were heavily intoxicated. Lee had been given permission by her parents to stay till 11. If testimonies are to be believed, she was one of a few underage girls invited to the party for the sole purpose of getting drunk and fucking. At approximately 10 o'clock, it was witnessed her being carried out to the beach by a teenage boy whose identity is now protected, claiming that he was going to fuck her. 20 minutes later, she returned from the darkness, distraught, blood running down her legs, screaming, I've been raped, I'm pregnant. This is when 19-year-old bouncer Guy Wilson said, hey guys, Lee is a slut. We might as well all get some. That is then the witnesses reported a group of 10 to 15 males circled the girl, kicked her, pissed on her, spit, and poured beer. As she threw a beer bottle at the group and attempted to leave, the bouncer, known as Fat Matt, grabbed her arm and dragged her into the darkness laughing. Let's all fuck her. And the hungry mob followed. Perhaps no one will ever know what happened to the girl with two names the same out on the sand dunes that night. But it is believed that she was raped by up to 15 teenagers. Then her face and skull bashed in by a large rock. Fat Matt said his confession had been beaten out of him. And that he didn't have sex with the girl. That he'd only finger fucked her. But he must have had big fingers because he ripped her from pussy to asshole. He said that he'd killed the girl because he was afraid that she'd tell people that he raped her. Refusing to implicate anyone, Fat Matt took the fall alone. Three teens were charged, only two served time, and none of those charges were for rape.
Queensville, about 50 minutes outside of Toronto. And I guess you could say it's an old-fashioned kind of place. Type where everybody knows each other. In a good way. Where you can leave your door unlocked. Where the variety store hands out candy on Halloween and knows each of your kids' names. It was nine-year-old Christine Jessup who was returning on the bus home from school. In the five-minute ride, she got off at about 3.40. Her mother and her 14-year-old brother were out shopping and wouldn't be back till later. She'd gone into the corner store, carrying her school recorder in one hand, her bag in the other, and bought herself some bubble gum. And Christine's death clock was now ticking. Within hours of the child's disappearance, the small community showed their solidarity and hundreds of volunteers searched the surrounding countryside. But as the hours became days, weeks, and then months, a syphilitic reality infected the small community. A reality you could hear in Christine's father's tortured voice. Yes, she wouldn't hurt anybody. Wouldn't hurt anybody at all. It was 89 days later that they would find Christine Jessup's mutilated body. A body that was so mangled, the only way her parents recognized her was by her white bobby socks. Raped, sodomized, her chest had been cut open with all her insides pulled out. And a killer had attempted to cut her head off and had given up and it was just hanging from its spine. The small town cops had a big city predicament. Up till now, their only unsolved crime was who broke the window down at Stanley's hardware store. But now, they were looking for an honest to goodness pedophile killer. One who liked chopping off children's heads, but weren't very good at it. And I guess they were worried that he were gonna become good at it as practice makes perfect. And although it seemed almost inconceivable, they figured it had to be someone from that tight-knit community because anybody else would have stood out like a quadriplegic stripper. So it was on Valentine's Day, 15 days after they'd found Christine's body, and they showed up at the Jessup's place to ask a few more questions. It's at this time detectives heard someone blowing on a clarinet. When they inquired, they were told it was the Morans, their neighbors, Guy Paul Morant, to be precise. So the detectives went over, knocked on the door and introduced himself. I told Guy that that was a real nice tune that he was playing. A bit fruity, but nice. Guy thanked them, and then that was the last of it. And as detectives John Shepard and Bernie Fitzpatrick drove away, Fitzpatrick made a cryptic entry in his detective's notepad. Paul Moran, clarinet player, weird type guy. In the room. Some have said that the problem with the investigation into Christine's murder was that it was marred from the start. The body had been found on New Year's Eve. A bunch of good old boys, all showing up in their pickup trucks, already three sheets to the wind. And to make matters worse, it was in the middle of a snowstorm. And the forensics team, yeah, if you can call it that, was a guy with a blowtorch and another joker with a gardening tool raking through what was left of the child. A button found at the scene of the crime had just disappeared. A milk carton that had been stuffed inside of Christine's chest cavity. A cigarette package, cigarette butts, all vanished. Simple fact was that the highest profile case they had before this was old Pearlie Jenkins having sex with Mrs. Edwards St. Bernard. And at least that had a happy ending. The backwater cops weren't stupid enough to not know that the whole country was watching. And if they solved the case, they'd be a bigger hero than Wayne Gretzky. And although Detective Shepard and Fitzpatrick had no leads, they had a nagging feeling about Guy Paul Moran. And it wasn't just Guy Paul, it was the whole family. They were queerer than Ellen Degenerate's Chihuahua. On the night that Christina had gone missing, and while the whole town was out searching for her, the Moran family had set up house lamps on their front yard 
and were doing the gardening into the early hours, hardly endearing themselves to a grief-stricken community. So Shepard and Fitzpatrick decided to pay the Morans a visit and have a little impromptu conversation with Guy Paul, inviting the 24-year-old factory worker into their car and keeping it real friendly-like, pretending that they were looking for information on Christine's family, and nothing that Guy Paul said seemed out of the ordinary. But as the conversation concluded and he was leaving the car, he turned to the officers and said Christine was such a sweet and innocent little girl. And then he smiled and said, but sweet little girls grow up to be corrupt. Shepard and Fitzpatrick wanted to bash his skull in right then and there, but they knew that they had to bide their time because it was still some of the pieces of the puzzle that weren't fitting, most notably the timeline. By witnesses and the parents' account, Christine had disappeared at around 3.30. Moran clocked off work at 3.32, meaning even if he had a rocket car, he couldn't have made it home till 4.15 leaving Guy with an alibi tighter than the Velcro strap on a cripple's boot. So if they were going to make this thing work, detectives were going to need the Jessops to be a little more flexible with their timings. Because the Jessops' son, Kenny, had told the investigators that he and his mother had arrived back at exactly 4.10. He'd seen it on the clock, and that Christine had already been abducted. Guy Paul's own parents said that he hadn't arrived home till 5.30, and he brought groceries with him. So unless he had a time machine, that didn't give him a lot of opportunity to rape, torture, and brutalize a young child, and then be home for dinner. So with the help of Shepard and Fitzpatrick, Kenny and his mother changed their arrival time to as late as 5.30, saying they weren't sure. Now after putting Guy Paul's alibi in question, detectives held a press conference trying to ruse Guy Paul. He lost control of himself and murdered her. In the press conference, they described having five persons of interest when they only really had just one. He is a ninth person. In fact, the only thing that Shepard and Fitzpatrick left out when describing the killer was that his name was Guy Paul and he played the clarinet. It was five days after that press conference that the two hero detectives arrest Guy Paul Moran, fittingly on the way to clarinet practice. And the shit-eating smile disappeared off of his face. It's at this point that a more discerning of minds might query what real evidence did the prosecution have? Yeah, sure, they had a bucket load of jizz, but they had no way of telling if that were the clarinet playing variety. Because in 1985, DNA was just a fancy set of initials. And you bet your sister's sweet ass that Gipo was a weirdo. But it wasn't no fucking crime to be a nutcase. When police combed over Moran's car, they found fibers from the kit. Five, to be precise. But that's not a shocker, since he was neighbors with the kit. The prosecution, knowing that they didn't have a lot, tried to work on getting jailhouse snitches to get a confession out of Moran. Throwing out deals like a bunch of used car salesmen. From the snitch's surveillance tape, Guy Paul can be heard repeating the word red rum. Red rum, which is murder spelled backwards from the Jack Nicholson movie The Shining. The snitch, also inside for murder, claimed that Moran on tape said, I read Rum the Innocent, just like you. But this wasn't clear enough to be admissible in court. Prosecutors had no problem in painting Moran as a creepy individual whose closeness to his family made other people uncomfortable, who liked tending to his beehives and fixing up old cars. And as for pussy, investigators wanted the public to believe he wasn't interested in it, unless it was nine years old and he killed it first. But it seemed to many outsiders, the cops had made their arrest, and now they were trying to build their case. It was five months after the nine-year-old's corpse had been discovered in a wooded area outside of town that the case took a bizarre turn. 
Christine's older brother, Kenny, had been suffering from nightmares. His sister, Christine, had been appearing to him in his dreams, telling him that her soul could not rest because she had not been properly buried. So under his dead sister's direction, he and his parents went out to the place where she was murdered, and remarkably, they found more of Christine's remains, and they brought them to the police, and cops were speechless. A family standing there with a child's beach bucket full of human remains? All they could do was dig the kid up again and see what was missing. And remarkably, like some sort of sick horror movie, every bit of gunk in that bucket belonged to Christine. And cops want now to learn how close Christine's brother Kenny really was to his younger sister. When detectives Fitzpatrick and Shepard asked Kenny what gives and how he knew where the rest of his sister's stiff was, well, Kenny came clean and confessed. He told the cops that he and his sister had been lovers, and not just an occasional stick and dip. They were long-term lovers, since she was five years old, and that he and his two amigos had regularly indulged in Christine's charms and had orgies with her, but they also had sex with each other. The real Sodom and Gomorrah. It is then that Detective Shepard turned off his tape recorder and leaned forward and ask Kenny Jessup, are you out of your fucking mind? Okay, let's put aside that you're fucking your own sister and that you're butt fucking your friends who are also fucking your sister. This gives the murder a whole new motive, jealousy, incest, and that's just the tip of the cock. Cause detectives now knew that they were holding a shit bomb that was about to go off and spray shit on everyone, except for Moran, because he'd be wearing a shitproof raincoat. Cause Kenny just handed him a get out of jail for free car. And the irony here is, is that the Jessups had been painting the Morans as the freaks. Meanwhile, their son Kenny still had the smell of his sister on the tip of his cock. But instead of going public with this information, prosecutors decided to put a cap on it and proceed with the prosecution of Guy Paul Moran. But now they were going forward with evidence that never existed. And if it did, it had been melted away. Well, prosecutors didn't have a snowball's chance in hell. And they had to cut the fruity clarinet player loose. Well, I think it's terrible that he got off. Personally, I think it should be hung. The real estate value of Queensville is going to drop dramatically. You know, it's going to go, the bottom's going to drop. Right. I think he's guilty. Yeah, we can't say that. No, we can't say that, no, but the police arrested him, right? Mm -hmm. But prosecutors weren't going to let a little thing like losing get in the way. That mixed with the fact that we're facing a million dollar payout to the Moran family. So after eight years of trying, they were able to take the case back to trial. And maybe they thought second time lucky, or that the Moran family would die, or just run out of money. And the second time around, the defense were feeling pretty confident. And why not, with detectives being charged with intimidating witnesses, falsifying evidence, ignoring evidence. And when the jury found out that Kenny and his friends had been fucking Christine since she was five years old, well, that's gotta turn things around, right? Well, it seems the jury had other ideas, and they still came back with guilty. Sentencing the creepy clarinet player to life. I might, uh, might just go and have a beer. <laughs> we intend to appeal this verdict. And I guess if there was a positive to be taken from a negative, the Jessup family finally had the closure that they fought so hard for. But that closure was not to last long. Because only three years later, DNA testing became advanced enough that the defense were able to have the jizz they dug out of Christine analyzed. And surprise, surprise, it wasn't the clarinet playing variety. In fact, there was a high probability that it belonged to her brother Kenny, 
or adopted brother, as he constantly reminded us. DNA exonerated me in two categories. There was a DQ alpha testing, and then there was a polymarker testing, that being more discriminative uh, of the first. And um, it totally exonerated me in both categories, uh, proving that me, Guy, here, <laughs> did not do this crime killing Christine Jessup. Just in heaven. I'm happy. I'm free. That's how I feel. Free. And it turns out that the guy that everybody figured were the creepiest turned out to be the least creepiest of all. And poor little Christine, with her brother and his friends popping a cherry, and the killer still at large. And after all this, it makes you kind of wonder that if after the trial, the good citizens of Queensville realize that it isn't the outsiders of this world that you gotta worry about, but it's the enemy within. In turn of the century France, there was a 50% child mortality rate, meaning if you were 10 years old, you had a 50-50 chance of making it there. Smallpox, measles, whooping cough, diphtheria, shit, even diarrhea would kill you. And 40% of all children's deaths occurred before they were five years old, with 15% not even making it to the age of one. Infant mortality was something that every family was no stranger to. Case in point, meet one Jean Weber, a handsome woman, and I guess you could say that she liked the kids. She liked them just fine. Although some may say too much, it was by 1905 that she had three of them to her loving husband. But it was also by 1905 that two of those children had died. This troubled Jean's husband so much that he turned to alcohol. Jean, being the stronger of the two, at first carried on like nothing had happened. Her and her husband tried to work it out, but I guess she got sick of him moaning about the loss of the children, and she moved on and left her surviving daughter with him. But I guess because she loved children so much, she decided to work with them and become a nanny and a babysitter. But wherever Jean Weber went, misfortune followed. And in three consecutive jobs as a nanny, the children died in her care. But I suppose there's no crying over spilled milk, and Jean would just move on to her next job. It's never been recorded whether she received good references or not, but it was after the fourth and the fifth kid that ended up dead. Well, Jean started getting herself a little reputation, and jobs involving taking care of children became fewer and far between, so she had to supplement her income by becoming a prostitute. But sucking cock could never take the place of children that would always be her first love. And she'd still pick up the odd childcare job. But it was always short times. In 1907 that a physician was summoned to a home where a nine-year-old lay dead. The doctor saw bruises on the young boy's throat and called the police. It was then that Jean Webb was arrested. But a lawyer got her off just as quickly when they argued that the boy had died of typhoid. It was two months later that a husband and wife returned early from the theater and came in and saw their babysitter standing over their son with one hand strangling him and the other stuffed up a pussy finger in herself. The distraught father had to punch the babysitter in the face three times before she'd loosen her grip on his son's lifeless body. Why stop it three times? How about four, five, six, seven, and eight? Enjoy yourself. When cops were called and they investigated the finger fucking killer, they found out that at least 10 children, including two of her own, had met their demise due to her sexual gratification. This time, the babysitter who was good with her fingers didn't get off. Well, I guess she did, but you know what I mean. Found insane and committed to an insane asylum. And it was there. Two years later, that she strangled herself to death. And when they found her, pussy juice was running down her legs. 